Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <coughs> Just take a moment to get set up. But before I even do that, how do, how do you even try to follow what Thomas has just done. That is just incredible. <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> In fact, while I was sitting at the back listening, I said, maybe I should just set an exam for all of you to see how much of that you remember. I've heard that. I've, I've known Thomas now for a few years, and I've heard a lot of that. I'm still just trying to absorb. There is so much knowledge, so much uh, experimental archaeology, I would call it, going on there, and it's just incredible what he's doing. Um, and I, I, I doubt, you know, I'm, I'm still, as I said, coming to terms with a lot of the techniques and the science and the, just the practical experiments that he's doing. It's absolutely phenomenal. And of course, <clears throat> we no longer call it the Book of Kells, now it's the Book of Port Mahomoc. But um, there you go, I got that wrong in my title. Now, I'm going to begin, actually, just to take a few minutes to do a little um, advertisement. This is, uh, you know, any good TV program, you have to watch the ads as well. So this is me for the last 16 or 17 years or so. I've lived in the 8th, 9th ninth century, um, and I'm only coming up for air in recent times. And um, this was my work on, in trying to understand the Book of Kells was just so absorbing and required so much time. I literally didn't, I wasn't aware of so much that was going on in particular. Uh, the wonderful work of the people who were involved here in the conference, and people like Thomas, um, and Stephen Walker. Well, I had met Stephen because Stephen was one of those first people who kind of bridged that gap between the, <coughs> the maker and the academic world. And Stephen just wows um, the academic conferences when he presents his work, as Thomas has done. Thomas joined the last conference, academic conference, and has added another dimension to that. And this is wonderful. You have uh, people like in UCD with um, programs in experimental archaeology, and I think the our cattle expert is was, is is or was based down there. That Thomas was uh, it was research. There was a pint of beer as well, but it was research going on there last night. It was phenomenal. Um, <laughs> And so I just want to very, very briefly tell you about uh, the book. Now, you might think, you might wonder why I am uh, putting up a little cartoon, another cartoon about a uh, miracle. Um, and this is, I'm very delighted to have been able to publish this. Um, why shouldn't I expect miracles? Well, to get this published by an academic press was a little bit of a miracle. Because it actually exists, you might just kind of take for granted, well, you know, he's a scholar, he did a study, so why wouldn't it be published? And um, this was my thesis. Uh, I was very fortunate to have Michelle Brown. Many of you will have either met or heard of Michelle Brown, just a phenomenal scholar. Michelle Brown turns out books uh, like some of you turn out paintings. Uh, I don't know what the count is at this stage, but it's absolutely phenomenal. And around 2015, I had to get my college in London asked me, I needed permission from Trinity College to um, put the, like most theses now, they go online. And this is what I got. Eventually, it took a while even to get their agreement that this would be published online. They really didn't want this book to be published. And that's why I say it's a little miracle. Actually, it's not a little miracle. It's a big miracle that this book has been published. And I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing, it's not that everything in here is right, is correct, is accurate. I hope it makes it's an honest attempt to contribute to scholarship and understanding. And that's all anybody can do in their time. Technologies will change and we'll, we'll make those things uh, better in time. But that's, this is one of the reasons why I want to encourage people to um, you know, pay attention to this. It's not for my sake, it's actually for the sake of scholarship on the Book of Kells and the next generation who will contradict what I'm doing. Um, as Thomas and people like that are doing already. But I've been very fortunate to have had a number of, even though they tried to restrict my publication, lots of people have, um, I've had access, some of the, the one of medieval humor isn't even out just yet. And I've been very, very fortunate. And that's why I'm wearing as well the um, conference t-shirt from Andover. This is another one of Ed Rooney's designs. 
And Stephen Walker, of course, as well as being a wonderful jeweller and uh, an academic in his own right as well now from the work he's doing, this is, this is his whole um, project, the fact that we're here. Um, and it's wonderful that Mike and so on has picked up the baton to carry on that idea. And I'm wearing this T-shirt to just as a little way of marking the fact that that started in 2019. Well, the first conference, the ideas started long before then. And again, I can't praise Mike enough for the work that he has done here in this absolutely wonderful centre. This is a fabulous venue for this and the work. Uh, Mike, you, you, you think it's just all happening, you know. But uh, this is the swan floating across the surface, but the legs are paddling frantically underneath. Mike has done phenomenal work to make all this seem as if it just kind of uh, happens. Um, so this is the book just published in last October. And um, I'm actually, <coughs> having concentrated on getting that out, there's a number of things that I'm doing. One of them is... Um, I'm actually trying to encourage Trinity College to change their attitude and to be more encouraging. Um, this, this is a recent attitude to be more encouraging of scholars, as I said, for the next generation and people like Thomas and, and the scholars that have even, haven't even started studying it yet. And I, I might, if you, if you want to come up to me at some stage during the day, I'm trying to put together a little petition just to encourage Trinity College that I will send to them. I've made a submission uh, to them already and I just want to add to that. But don't feel under any pressure, please. And um, certainly don't do it if you want to potentially have career opportunities in Trinity College, <laughs> don't put your name to that. And in any case, you just may be uncomfortable signing something like that, and I understand that. That's, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, <clears throat> now, another thing that... So I just want to tell you about the book. This is the, the website, the wonderful Sidestone Press in Leiden in the Netherlands. And you can get an e-book copy for 15 euros you can get a paperback for 60 euros. Now, unfortunately, that's about, if you go to your bookshop, I got a bit of a land when I discovered, I went into my local bookshop in Limerick and said, what would it cost? They said, it was about 70 or more. That's very expensive. If you want a hardback book, it's 120, probably in realistic terms, more like 130, but that's academic publishing, unfortunately, phenomenally expensive. But the wonder, the wonder of Sidestone Press is everything they produce is free to read online. Um, so far, I think it's nearly 360 now, but 353 people since I've published this have downloaded my book. I'm thrilled. I'm jumping up and down. I'm never going to make money out of this. Um, and, but I do want hard copies to go out into the world. And for the conference here, and I've been, I, I bought a bunch of copies at, at an author's discount. I'm sticking them into bookshops all over the place. If you want a copy, and it's still very dear, still an expensive book. And this is not the, intro, you know, the beginner's guide to the Book of Kells. This is serious, if you're seriously interested in it. But I'd even encourage people, look, encourage your librarian, encourage your school, your college to get copies. I've been busy trying to get copies into libraries in the Republic. And maybe um, <coughs> Mike or somebody here might, you know, they might be saying, OK, let's, let's stick a few copies in so that at least they're available. Um, now, the, another thing that I'm doing, so uh, Connor, if you could just stick up that little, um, another initiative that I'm doing is a website, and I've referenced this in my book, so I wanted to get it up at some level, um, that's just a still, and Connor, but there's a lovely little animation that I began to design, but then I got a former student of mine to do it, he studied animation, and uh, it's a lovely little bit of fun, but in this, and I'm not going to take it through the website, but I would encourage people to, just to have a look. So under media, for example, I have all of Kell's initials as they occur sequentially, and this is something like about 4,000 initials. This is, the numbers are phenomenal, but I also have them grouped as A's and B's and C's. So if you're a designer or an artist and you're looking for an A in the book of Kells, I needed one for my tattoo here. And we, uh, I literally, I used that database that I had built. So, there's, and a number of other things that I want to make available. And I hope this might be useful to, um, yeah, if you go scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that little motif um, uh, playing a, a little bit more, a little bit larger. And it's, I think it's quite nice 
realise what, uh, as I said, this former student of mine did. But, um, all right. <laughs> um, so, just, it, I hope it'll be a resource. Uh, uh, it's, I'm, it's only in its infancy. I haven't had time to really get involved in it because I've been too busy with the book. And, uh, but I want to get back to that in a few months' time and uh, try and build on that. I'm actually going to do every page in the Book of Kells, a translation, the Latin, the translation, talk a little bit, a few sentences about what's interesting or unusual in the Book of Kells. I don't know if anybody will be interested, but... Then that's enough. One person is enough. Okay, we'll move back to the... And thank you for your patience with the advertisements. Uh, the commercial is over. I'm going to try and get on to the paper. So um, that's just the title of it. Um, and I want to begin especially by remembering this individual, Megan and others have mentioned, Dr. Peter Harbison. Um, he's being cremated just as we speak. Uh, wonderful guy. Um, when I came to all of this, it was really outside of the um, university. I, I, you know, I wasn't in a university. I was a teacher and an artist, and I hadn't a clue what I was doing. I hadn't a clue where I was going. One of the first people who were, was a fantastic mentor for me was Peter Harbison. And, and I was down at the... Um, I'm just going to get this. I was down at the... When we, Mike was giving us that wonderful tour of the... Um, Museum, and he mentioned that, oh, Peter did uh, this book, The High Crosses and Round Towers of County Down. And I bought this as my little memento mori of, I didn't buy the High Cross, I'm sorry, Mike, my budget is shot. <laughs> but I bought this just as a little, for me, a very, very uh, poignant memory of Peter. And I discovered a very unusual little connection with my family. I discovered a few years ago that an aunt of mine was a child nurse to Peter and his brother, who was quite well known as well because he was the state pathologist, that's the late John Harbison, uh, was the state pathologist. My aunt used to mind them when they were babies. So anyway, now I'd love to be able to continue by just talking, but if I do, I've gone over time what I intended to do for this already. It's lovely to hear somebody like Thomas and many of the other speakers who have just spoken. If I don't stick to my script, I will, um, you won't get lunch. And um, so, in addition to Peter's enduring leg legacy of wonderful scholarship, he leaves a great legacy of warmth and friendship. And it, many of you here, or several at least, will have known him. Uh, just a thorough gentleman, a wonderful scholar. So, Eryeshte Goreva Anam Dealish. Thank you, Peter. Um, now, for those who are familiar with my work, it won't come as a surprise that I'll be talking about the book of. Port Mahon book, the book of Kel, otherwise known as the book of, formerly known as the book of Kells. Kells has, of course, inspired many responses uh, from artists over the years, like these, for example, by Margaret Stokes, 140 years ago, or thereabouts, and by this Japanese artist, Mise Tanaka. Uh, this, I think, was published in 2009. I'll have her book available. It's, hard, it's almost impossible to get here, but Mise Tanaka, she's about 80. She's just finished the Book of Kells. She's now starting on the Book of Doro. Um, I, you'll be able to have a look at her book. Uh, we exchanged copies of our books there last autumn. Uh, an incredible lady. She obviously, you'd imagine, she must have an Irish granddad or something. No, she doesn't. Um, this lady has no connection with Ireland, but this is the power of Kelty, of the art that, that inspires all of us, and certainly the Book of Kells. I'll be showing, I had been making available some work by uh, Barcelona, uh, artist calligrapher Josep Batley, in that little exhibition afterwards as well. Again, Josep doesn't have an Irish granny or a granddad. He's not from Newton Ards or from Kells or anywhere like that. Nobody, where he lives, nobody is interested in what he's doing. You know, and this is wonderful. We all beaver away in our own little patches. And this is what's wonderful about this. And the conversations, listening to people over coffee, sharing ideas about key pattern and knitting and whatever. It, it's, it's just fantastic. This is wonderful. And a lot of it happens at 1 o'clock in the morning. You know, some of the important stuff. Not here listening to me, but at 1 o'clock in the morning in the, in the pub afterwards. So, as I said, in, in my work... Uh, which challenges the received wisdom, the long-held view that Kells was the work of a large team of scribes and artists, I've concluded that it was entirely the work of two individuals. And I call these the master artist and the scribe artist. 
And as the name suggests, only the latter was responsible for the script, while both were artists. Now, in the paper, I'll begin by taking a brief look at some of the features that distinguish the work of one from the other, and especially in their handling of figures. Now, most of you are kind of into the knotty verse and all of that, and the focus of this is more on the figurative art, which throws up its own sort of issues and questions. And the scribe artist is most is responsible for most of these in the manuscript, and I'll focus on some of the aspects that are distinctive in his figurative work. At the end of the paper, I'll finish off by having a look at the reactions of some later artists and commentators to such work in Kells. So, to begin then, the master artist. The artist formerly known as the goldsmith. That was the name given to him by the great scholar François Henri. And Henri identified him as the creator of such masterful pieces as the Cairo page here. And the evidence revealed in my research suggested that he had a greater involvement in the creation of the manuscript. And I devised the name Master Artist to reflect this expanded role. He's an artist that seems most at home working within the repertoire of curvilinear and geometrically based motifs, many of which are found here on the Cairo page or on the so-called eight circle cross carpet page. And we'll zoom in, I hope you can see that little red outline. We'll zoom in on this disc here at the upper left and such motifs and this kind of work generally is especially familiar to us from the metalwork of the period. Are you there, Jordan? Right, you have, Jordan has the t-shirt with the, the this all was, I think that's the... Mo <laughs> Probably a good idea. Uh, that, is, that is the design on your shirt, yeah. Fabulous. So you can, I mean, you don't need, you don't, you've probably seen these things already anyway. You don't need me to explain that. It, it, it speaks for itself. And the, similarly here on the back of the, tar, uh, sorry, that's the Dronor disc, and similarly here on the back of the Tara brooch. And comparisons have often been made between these kinds of work. And who knows, perhaps the master artist's background and training were rooted directly or indirectly within such a metalwork context. The master artist does include some figurative work from time to time, as here on the Cairo page. And this is the head of Christ. Again, can you see those little red outlines? Um, uh, that's the uh, head of Christ at the end of the letter Rho, and I've rotated it for a more normal view. Or here we see some creatures from the Lucan genealogy on folio 30 V and Kells. And we see the same precision and fineness that we find in his more geometric work. In terms of the classical tradition, the head of Christ is uh, perhaps the most accomplished human representation in the Book of Kells. The red marks in his hair are, in my opinion, by the scribe artist, if you can see what I'm referring to there, the little red ink editions. And these, along with the simple interlace and stepped patterns, are clearly not as finely rendered as the surrounding motifs. I believe these were added later in what I've identified as a second campaign of work. Only the scribe artist survived at this time to attempt the completion of the manuscript. Attempting to tease out the contributions of both artists in the first campaign and those of the scribe artist in the second campaign has been a painstaking process in my research over the years. The master artist also occasionally incorporates more of the figure as here on folio 1V in the beginning of the canon tables. And here again another human torso on the last page of Kell's Illuminated Canon Tables on folio 5R. And just see the two together. I think the head of the figure on the left was added by the scribe artist, but otherwise these seem to be the work of the master artist. While neither figure is anatomically perfect, they're both reasonably well proportioned, and I want to draw particular attention to the arms and gripping hands of both figures. 
The fingers on the hand of the figure on the left are accurately stepped, if you know what I mean by that. Um, and the and this left hand is holding a book, although that's difficult to see anymore. There's a lot of abrasion on that page. In the figure on the right, the bent arm and gripping hand are also pretty accomplished, even if the arm isn't quite perfectly aligned with the shoulder. So bearing these in mind, let's compare some of the figurative work I've attributed to the scribe artist. Here's a figure from the second page of the Canon Tables. Another from folio 183R. And another from, a third from folio 187V. That's the final page of Mark's Gospel. Looking at the hands and arms of these figures, we can spot a number of problems. They're all depicted with a right arm, but the gripping hand is the left one in each case. And looking at the figure on the left, if we see the area outlined in red as showing the forearm from the elbow, it then appears to have a second forearm added with the wrong hand. Switching our attention to his legs, we can see the manner in which the right leg is extended upwards. And we can only guess that it would have to be joined to the body somewhere behind the double forearms, but way too high in the figure. The idea of showing the body and limbs beneath the clothing worn by a figure goes back quite a way to the beginnings of classical art, if not even further beyond that. But Here's a small bronze statue, probably of a goddess, and her legs are clearly depicted, or at least strongly suggested, beneath her robe. Here's another example, again from ancient Greece. And here on a painted vase from around 490, BCE, and we can see the outline of the woman's legs beneath uh, her, or through her thin dress. In all three cases, the anatomy of the figures is accurate in its literal and visual detail. It's coherent and well realized. Returning to our figures in Kells, we can identify some of the difficulties the scribe artist seems to have had. In the first one, as mentioned, the leg is not connected to the body in a way that makes any anatomical sense. In the middle one, the right leg is much too short and not aligned with the left leg. Um, and if we try to imagine the legs here, uh, on the, in the figure, whoops, sorry, I've just gone too far. In the figure on the right, we quickly realize there's only room for the lower part. They're far too small in proportion to the upper body. And here we can see a simple version of legs shown beneath a robe. This is in the Codex Amiatinus and portrays Ezra, which was probably copied from a Roman model, even perhaps an image that actually came from Rome. But in general terms, a Roman model, I mean a model that is showing some knowledge of the classical tradition. And the Matthew portrait in the Lindisfarne Gospels seems to have been derived either from the Amiatinus figure or perhaps they shared the same exemplar, maybe a manuscript that came directly from Rome uh, to Northumbria at that time. And the maker of the Lindisfarne Gospels, Eadfrith, has done a reasonable job in copying it and dealing with the complexities of the human figure. These are less successful, at least in the context of the classical tradition. And I want you to turn your attention now to the feet at the bottom of each of these images. Here, they're all rendered in a type derived from classical contrapposto. This is another feature that has its origins in classical art. A contrapposto pose, at its simplest, is a figure standing in a relaxed manner with more weight on one foot. So if I was a, sto a soldier standing to attention, I'm like that. If I'm in a contrapposto, which is a normal kind of pose for any human being if you're standing up, you know, you have more weight on one leg, the other, you sometimes, you, 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 and then you change it around. That's why you have a bar and a pub, you know, so you can do that. Uh, it physically, it's very restful, and it, it, it creates a lovely movement through the body and so on. Um, and this is one of the more famous early Greek instances. Here's a well-known statue of Caesar Augustus. And you notice the way they've very, very modestly put the, uh, 
image source there, not quite so here. You'll all recognize David instantly, Michelangelo's David. This is from the Renaissance, a time when the ancient classical traditions were being revived. When we place the feet of the Kells figures in this context, we can understand the source from which they were derived. Where have I lost my... Um, right. These Kells figures, uh, sorry, these ancient uh, feet juxtaposed... No, sorry, I'm, 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 I've lost my... These ancient, ancient traditions were revived in painting also, pardon me. And here we see Kells' contrapposto feet juxtaposed with another Renaissance, famous Renaissance painting, Botticelli's Primavera. You may know it as the Rite of Spring. And this painting, of course, also incorporates the other classical conventions we've been looking at. In addition to the details of the contrapposto poses, we can recognize the see-through costumes, revealing the limbs beneath, and so on. And I suppose we'd have to admit that the scribe artist doesn't quite achieve uh, the same level of elegance as Botticelli. But of course, this is not what the scribe artist is aiming for, even if he is trying to incorporate some elements of the classical models. Botticelli's image is at an extremely sophisticated end of this classical art, and it's fairer, perhaps, to compare the scribe artist's work with the more contemporary religious art, such as the Ezra figure we saw earlier, Aad Fritz version in the Lindisfarne Gospels, or a one I haven't shown you, this 6th century Byzantine or classically inspired mosaic. This one is in the baptistry of the Arians in Ravenna. Of course, even compared with these, we can identify the challenges facing the scribe artist as he tries to incorporate elements of classical art. And if we would more time, we could also have uh, considered his struggles in attempting to handle the drapery of the figures. I've suggested that he compensates for his inadequacies by uh, employing a kind of copy and paste approach, using a sort of identikit assortment of parts. This results in his figures looking like they've been assembled from disparate elements, often with little or no sense of how these should be combined and proportioned. His muddled attempts would seem to indicate the absence of any knowledge of anatomy, and one might reasonably assume that this just wasn't part of his artistic training. And similar Patterns are identifiable in the scribe artist's treatment of heads. This is the head of Christ from folio 202v, the so-called temptation page. And I have an idea that the scribe artist may have used the master artist's head of Christ from the Cairo page as a kind of a guide or a model. In comparing the two, we can spot many differences. And one of the most obvious, perhaps, is the size of the eyes. Are much too large on the scribe artist's head on the left. And linked to the eyes and eyebrows, we can see that the nose here is also too big. Another detail is the position of the ear. In the master artist's head, we can see this is reasonably accurate, being opposite the nose, as we all learned maybe if you studied drawing. And the ear on the left, however, is way up here, uh, and it seems to be connected with his hairline. And this is, in, uh, so in particular, these two aspects, the position of the ear and the combined eyes, nose, mouth grouping of features became a useful diagnostic um, in distinguishing the work of the two artists. And I examined all these heads and kells by drawing them, tracing them. Uh, and that revealed a formulaic pattern. And this becomes even more apparent when you juxtapose it again with the master artist's head from the Cairo page. You can see he's got the proportions, you know, more accurately and so on. But um, despite all his shortcomings, do you recognize this? Or classical failings, we can see that the scribe artist's distinctive style was alive and well. 
as Picasso explored this, the expressive power of art forms beyond the dominant and classically inspired academic conventions. His revolutionary Les Demoiselles d'Avignon was a deliberately controversial artistic statement. And I just love the way the eyes are kind of doing the same thing in both cases. Now, I'm going to change tack to another. Uh, we're leaving all that for the moment. I will come back to a few comments on the scribe artist. Whoops. How, how am I doing on time, Mike? Am I... Oh, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, let's, let's see if we can do this. Right. Um, <clears throat> So this, uh, in, uh, I, I want to look at the reactions of some commentators on Kell's figurative art. And the first of these is Christopher de Hamel and his meetings with remarkable manuscripts. This publication is itself remarkable, a really wonderful book on manuscripts, and I'd recommend it to anybody. It's wonderful in most respects, I think, that is with the exception of some of the author's comments on the book of Kells. In his account of the Kells Virgin and Child page, de Hamel writes that the picture is dreadfully ugly. Mary's head is far too big for her body. She has huge, staring, red-lined eyes and a long nose which looks as though it is dripping downwards, and a tiny mouth. Her pendulous breasts are visible through her purple tunic, and her little legs stick out sideways like a child's drawing. The baby, seen in profile, is grotesque and unadorable, with wild red hair, like seaweed, we've had seaweed already, protruding upturned nose and chin, and a worrying red line from his nose to his ear. And he goes on to say the child has two left feet, and Mary has also, but anyway. De Hamel, all, whoa, how, how am I gone into that? <laughs> It's just so good, it keeps popping up. <laughs> uh, if we can just go back to the um, PowerPoint again. Sorry, I don't know what, what maybe I did something there, um, Connor. And Connor has been brilliant while he's doing that. Hasn't Connor just been fantastic doing all the sound and the everything? I'm saying that in the hopes that he can put this back on screen again. <laughs> Okay, you'll have to go down to about 100 now or something like that if you can, because um, we rejigged the numbers, so if you can just sort of fly. So here you're getting a recap of everything. <laughs> now, I hope this will go in as injury time, Mike, in the... <laughs> okay, well, uh, yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, just go back one minute. Well, I can, I can take it from there. So the uh, grotesque and... Unadorable. <laughs> so, now, where am I? Um, yes, de Hamel also states that I'm not qualified to say whether the four unpleasant-looking angels are lifelike, but they are certainly anatomically very improbable beneath their weighty garments. And we can certainly see many of the features we looked, sorry, this is me talking again now, we can certainly see many of the features we looked at earlier, in particular the lower hands of both angels, which seem unconnected to the body, at least not with any sense of anatomical accuracy. And if we move to the angels at the bottom, we can see again uh, the hands, in particular this one here, just, you know, just doesn't make any sense in relation to how it would connect to the body. It's just kind of stuck on there. Um, <clears throat> so, childish, dreadfully ugly, unpleasant, grotesque, and unadorable. What then did de Hamel have in mind? Maybe paintings like this one by Caravaggio, where the old and simple peasants are contrasted with the youth youthful and beautiful young mother holding her naked baby. The low neckline of her dress, perhaps more pleasant and adorable. This, of course, like the following images, simply conforms to the conventions of another era, where Mary is presented as a beautiful young woman and her child may be depicted like any other and even unclothed. She may be shown breastfeeding the infant. She may even begin to engage the viewer her eyes turning to face directly out of the picture. 
as we see here again in this famous circular composition by Raphael. And of course, Raphael painted a whole series of these Madonnas, uh, pictures many of whom you'll be, many of which you'll be familiar with from Christmas cards. Very beautiful things. De Hamel's comments seem a little strange, coming as they do from one of the leading manuscript experts in the world. He's brilliant. He isn't lacking in scholarly knowledge. However, he may simply have been in playing to the gallery by poking fun at the most treasured art heritage of his neighbours in Ireland. You also get a sense that when, uh, of this when reading de Hamel, how de Hamel prefaces his remarks about the Virgin and Child when he states that, as a result of what I am about to say, I shall probably have my permission to visit the Republic of Ireland revoked forever. And of course, nothing could be further from reality. We can take a joke as well as anything else, but if he is actually serious in his comments, we can understand that his taste in painting just seems to be rather limited. Really needs to get out a bit, take some air, and hopefully become a bit more open and receptive to art that doesn't quite fit his apparently narrow sense of the aesthetic. <laughs> rather than banning him from entry to Ireland, we'd welcome him wholeheartedly, endeavour to broaden his artistic horizons, educate him, and this is what happened about 1400 years ago, when many English had left their own country and retired to Ireland. And this is the account written by uh, the first British or English historian, the Venerable Bede, who continues by saying that the Irish welcomed them all greatly, gave them their daily food, provided them with books to read and instruction without asking for payment. They just love what they do. Uh, that's why the likes of Thomas and the rest of you share your ideas. We just, we love this stuff and we share it. We don't want any money in return, other than enough to live on. Now, I hasten to add that Christopher de Hamel was very welcoming to me personally in the early days of my thesis research. He was then librarian at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, and he facilitated my examination of several original manuscripts. So I'm just, I'm just having, poking a little fun back at Christopher here, but I just don't think you should say that stuff. It doesn't make sense, of course, to compare apples with oranges. The Virgin and Child illumination in Kells has much more in common with images like this, an icon from Santa Maria in Trastevere in Rome. And medieval art historian Larry Nees notes that in the religious art of this time, a tendency to reduce or altogether remove action from the image which conveys the holy figure as if present, perhaps awaiting the beholder's invocation to come alive. And he goes on, it is this frozen quality, often seen in images that, pardon me, regard as portraits, which is usually meant by the term iconic. And there's little doubt that the formal language of early Christian icons reflects the language of late Roman imagery, formulaic and abjuring naturalism in favour of conveying a higher truth. Now, I'm going to conclude by taking a look at another illumination in Kells and the reaction of another artist to this. We're hopefully racing to the end line. Are we doing okay, Mike? Uh, the so-called Arrest of Christ page in the Book of Kells. And you may be aware that the distortions in the set... Oh, I've done it again. Where's Connor? What, what am I doing, Connor? I do apologise. I'm, I'm obviously hitting some button here that's ridiculously... Um, so I might even be able to continue... Oh, great, we're there. Fantastic. Thank you. I'll try and... Um, Try not to do that again. So you may be aware that the distortions in the central figure of Christ here have been understood as forming the X-shaped chi of his abbreviated name. And I know Thomas has done some work on this, um, but we don't have time to go into that now. One o'clock tonight. Um, when we look at the attendant figures on either side, we can identify some of the details with which we've become familiar. For example, the contrapposto feet of the figure on the left, 
and we can also see the poor proportions of the legs as they appear beneath the robes. In both cases, following the upper leg from the bent knee, we can see that the hips are far too low down in relation to the rest of the figure. Now, of special interest here um, are the hands of these attendants as they grip Christ's arms. And here we see an illustration of this page from a book published in 1868 by Westwood. Um, and you can actually, even though it was published in 1868, there's a modern reprint of that. I was showing it to Thomas, and there are some quite interesting things. If anybody wants to see it afterwards, you're welcome to have a look at that. You can get it for a few quid online, which is nice. Um, so, um, that's by John Obadiah Westwood, um, just a little earlier than the Cairo page by Margaret Stokes that we saw earlier. And like Stokes, Westwood was a prominent scholar of insular manuscripts in the 19th century. But let's look closely at this hand in particular, again outlined in red. We can, in Kells, we can see that instead of gripping Christ's arm, the left hand is shown in front of it. Westwood, or his lithographer, maybe it wasn't Westwood because a lithographer would have had to draw these up on a stone for printing at the time, probably assuming this is an error, has decided that he will improve on the original. And in his drawing, the hand is shown actually gripping the arm of Christ. And this discovery prompts us to look for other discrepancies or corrections. In Westwood's image, we could play a game of spot the difference. We might compare the eyes of the attendant figures and note that they have been reduced in size in Westwood's picture. Christ's eyes have been modified a bit also. We might also observe that the dangling hand of the figure on the right has been given a bit of an angle, a bit of bone there to make it appear less limp. The distinctive approach devised by the scribe artist, of course, creates an issue for anyone like yourselves, artists, trying to create figurative work in his style. And our visual culture is saturated in photographs of photographically based images, and any art training most of us will likely have had will have incorporated some sense of anatomical accuracy and proportion. Like Westwood, we may be inclined to render things a little bit more accurately, tidy things up a bit. It's difficult, if not impossible, to avoid the consequences of our conditioning. If you've learned to work in a particular way, it's quite hard not to do so. Whatever about copying something faithfully, just as it is, and this is important for the artists here, how then does one go about creating new work if you're trying to do it in the style of the scribe artist in Kells? Do you deliberately make it misshapen and whatever? So, just a few concluding remarks. Mike is being very patient. He hasn't thrown anything at me yet. Over my career as an art teacher, I've known many students who felt they were inadequate in attempting to draw the figure from life. I have a particular memory of twin girls who came from Yorkshire and who briefly attended our school. That's down in County Limerick. And I'll never forget the frustrated comment of one who simply said, I can't draw it, chaps. And I, I didn't understand what she was saying, first of all, and I'm sure I'm not doing justice to her lovely accent. But I think you get the idea. And some students, of course, don't have these difficulties. For them, drawing figures comes easily, almost in instinct, intuitively. They don't need much instruction in anatomy and proportion. These appear to come naturally or instinctively. Perhaps this was the case with the master artist. Although his work is not perfect, as we've seen, he seems to have had a better grasp of the classical tradition. The scribe artist, on the other hand, seems to have more in common with my Yorkshire friend. It's as if some people suffer from a kind of mental block. And this is only exacerbated as they look enviously at their classmates' drawings, for whom all this seems to come very easily. And as many of you here are, are artists, you were probably in the gifted elite side of things. And you know, the teacher wants a poster. Oh, Mary will do the poster. She's good at art. You get that kind of knee-jerk reaction. Oh, sure, I'm hopeless. I wouldn't be able to do anything. And for those who believe they don't possess these natural gifts, if you want to call them that, the I can't draw chaps brigade, this hang-up unfortunately becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy which further undermines their confidence. And I'd find myself having to encourage students to give themselves a chance not to be defeated by this negative attitude before they even start. 
So returning to the scribe artist, last few sentences. It's interesting to note that he didn't seem to be bothered by these inhibitions when he was adding figurative terminals, for example, to his initials. In these instances, he's not trying to replicate figures within the classical tradition. He's not burdened by these conventions. And he seems to have thoroughly embraced and enjoyed the freedom of twisting creatures and people into letter forms. What then are we to make of the scribe artist's figurative work? on the illuminated pages. Must we consider that this is poor art, childish, and should it be dismissed as unpleasant, ugly, and even grotesque? I believe most people take a more reasonable view. Even when attention is drawn to some of his anatomical inadequacies, I think they and we are all happy to see these features simply as part of the distinctive character and charm of this remarkable work. Just as we must take a different approach if we want to appreciate and understand artists like Picasso and others whose work defies the tyranny of dominant schools, we must be similarly sympathetic to the scribe artist. In my opinion, most people are quite content to do just that, to take such work on its own terms and appreciate it for what it is in its own particular context. Gurmila Mahogov, thank you.